Once upon a time, in a faraway country, there was a wise and generous queen. Her, her name was Moira. And Queen Moira was an excellent queen. She ruled her people well. But it was not an easy land where they lived. There was not a great abundance of wealth there. There wasn't things to make their people rich, like gold or silver. And even farming was difficult. The, the farmland was not always of the best quality. And so the queen had a, a lot to do. She had to be a wise and careful ruler to use the resources in her land well. But she did an excellent job of that over the years, and her people loved her for it, and she loved her people. But as the queen got older, she realized she had to begin thinking about who would be the, the next ruler of her people. And she had three daughters, actually. And so this gave her an abundance of options, and especially because these three daughters were triplets. They were all born on the same day, and so none of them was older or younger than the other. So any three of them could have potentially been the next queen. And so like many rulers in her situation, Queen Moira decided that she would give each of her daughters some responsibility in her kingdom and see how they handled it. And the daughter, the princess that used it best, would become the next queen. And so the first princess, Princess Janine, was, was a very wise young woman. And, and she had studied long and hard as a, as a young woman. And so as she became older, the queen thought, well, what better way to test her than to put her in the law courts as a judge? In, in her land... Of course, she was the final court of appeal. You know, her land was different than we would do in Canada. We would have separate courts, and the prime minister wouldn't make decisions like that. But for a king or a queen, they were always the final judge in difficult cases. And so she thought, what better way to test her, her uh, daughter Janine than to make her a judge in the court and see how she, how she did? Well, she did excellently. And over the course of months and a few years, she consistently made wise decisions. She decided cases that befuddled other people. The evidence presented before her uh, was sometimes seemed lacking, and yet somehow she understood the situation well enough that she could make a good decision. And so she became, in a way, famous. Uh, she was respected, especially by the wealthier and more well-to-do people within her kingdom because they knew they could expect fair judgments for her. And so they would celebrate her. Even at Christmas, you know, people would come and bring her Christmas presents just because they appreciated how wise and generous she was in her rulings. And so she was well-liked. She had many friends, ma many rich friends, in fact, and the gifts kept coming. But over the course of years, all those gifts started to have a subtle effect on Princess Janine. All of a sudden, it seemed as though her rulings were still wise, but people wondered. They seemed to often go in the favor of her rich friends. She liked to be in their company, and when she wasn't in the court, she liked to hang out with these wealthy and well-to-do people. And, and her subjects began to, began to mutter. And say, well, she doesn't like associating with the poor people of the kingdom. And if you go to her law court against a wealthy person, you should not expect that you will necessarily be heard. And so as these rumors circulated, they eventually reached Queen Moira. And she came to her one day and said, you know, I've reviewed your decisions that you've been making. And every one of them, they are wise and just. And you have ruled well. Your decisions have shown your wisdom and, and that you have studied the laws studiously. But she says your relationships with your people show that while you take concern about making the right decision, you have not had the same concern just to show that you love them. And so you will not be the next queen of our land. Well, at the same time this was going on, the second daughter, Dina, was being 
was being eyed by her mothers, potentially she would be the next queen. Dina was a a strong, athletic person, even from a young age. She loved to be out and, and playing with the boys in the, in, the, in the court at whatever game they would be at. And it didn't matter whether it was a simple game of hopscotch or something rough and tumble. She was in there, thick as a thief. She was brave and courageous and not easily uh, shied away from, from difficult tasks, even in, in sports and, and different arenas. And so... With that natural bent, her mother thought she would make an excellent army officer. And so she enrolled her, and she, she, she was. She was a born leader. Her troops quickly became loyal to her because she treated them well. She, she didn't just go out on the battlefield to lead them, but she also cared about the people that she was in command of. And so she, wherever she went in the military, she brought success. She quickly, over the course of months and years, climbed the chain of command until she was a general in the army. And and she gained a reputation for for her victories. And her fame went before her throughout the land. But her fame, unfortunately, also went to her head. And so Princess Dina, while on the battlefield, was courageous and inspired loyalty among her troops when she came home. She felt that she had earned something on the battlefield, that, that her people owed her something. And so if she was in a, even a small town or village, she would demand the best food that they have. And, the, and she would go to the, most, the best and most opulent house in the village, even if it, it was just a small village and it was just a mud hut. It had to be the best mud hut. And that is where she would stay, no matter who she had to displace, whether it was a an elderly person or a, a, an expectant mother, she would make them leave so that she could stay there. And so she traveled around the country and, and her fame preceded her, but also her reputation, that wherever she stayed, she might kick somebody out and, and that she would expect, expect the best from her people. And so as this reputation preceded her of course it would eventually trickle up to the palace and queen moira found out and so she went to her and she said princess dina your your fame precedes you and and the whole kingdom is thankful for the victories the battles that you've won the enemies you've defeated you're obviously willing to risk your personal safety to sacrifice your own comfort to protect your people she said but I have this against you. It, when you come home, it's obvious that you've done this for your own prestige, it, to, to, for your own sense of well-being for the country, to uphold that, and you've not done it to, for the love of your people. And that becomes obvious when you come and you stay in their villages and their towns. And so I do not think you can be the next queen. But as I said, Queen Moira had three daughters, and the final one was Princess Karen. Now, Karen was not so distinguished as a child as the other two. She di- didn't have natural inklings uh, of what she, role she might play well in the kingdom. And so Queen Moira was somewhat perplexed. She didn't know what to do with her when she sent her out to, to test her ability. And so she thought, well, I'll just try something very broad, kind of generic to see how she will rule. And so one of her provinces was, was ruled by a very able and really an excellent governor. And so she sent Princess Karen to, her, to him and said to the governor, I want Princess Karen to take your place. I want her to rule as governor in this province, and you will uh, mentor her and, and help her in her uh, learn her role, and then we will see how she does. So Princess Karen was obedient, and she came and, and did the job, and, and she seemed capable enough. She did not make any grand mistakes or l- show any great lapses in judgment. She was a decent governor, but not excellent, N- certainly not as... D- it was obvious after a few months that she would never be as distinguished, actually, as the former governor. As I said, their, their land was not rich, and so it was difficult to govern. It was difficult to be that person in authority because they didn't even have a lot of food all the time. There were hungry people in the land, 
and she had to manage the food supply well. They often had to trade valuable things that they had just to have enough food to eat in the land. And so no one starved when Princess Karen was governor of that province, but it seemed the, the province was not getting further ahead either. In fact, it, it was doing worse under her rule, she could tell, than over the, under the previous governor. So after several months, she came to her mentor and said, I don't think I will ever do as good a job as you can. And I don't think that just because I am princess, I should take your spot. So I want you to take back the governorship. And the, the governor was startled. He said, well, but you're, the queen has ordered us to do this. And she, she s- said, yes, and someday I may be queen as well. So you may want to think about what my orders as well. I order you to take back the governorship. And he, he said, well, what are you going to do instead? She said, well, I'm a capable governor, but I feel like my efforts could be used somewhere else. My people are hungry. And and perhaps I can help solve that problem more directly. And as they talked, Princess Karen laid out her plan to the the governor. There were several parcels of land within that province that had never really been used. It was such such poor farmland that, that it was not even in their province, even used for farmland. They, they used them, some of them, for refuse heaps, for dumps, garbage dumps. And so the princess says, I'm going to take one of those garbage dumps, I'm going to clear the land, and I'm going to use it to farm. And so she did. And she left the governorship, she left sort of the opulence of, of ruling, and she decided to be a farmer. And so she wor- found one of these parcels of land and began clearing it. And, but she was a princess, and, and her fame somewhat preceded her as well, and she had worked as the governor. People knew her. And so people still came to her with, with requests. There was many hungry people. And she did have some money, being a princess, and so when somebody who was poor would come to her, she could not immediately give them food, for she was just clearing the land, but she could give them work. And so she employed several of the poor people of her community to clear this land, and begin working on this farm. Well, obviously, if you have poor land to begin with, and it's got been used as a garbage dump, you're not going to make a great crop right away. And so she decided she would raise animals instead. And because they're usually seen as dirty animals and, and smelly, she decided to raise pigs. That seemed the best way that she could help her people. Everybody loved, there loved ham and bacon and pork, and that was no problem. People loved to eat it. They just didn't want to farm it. And so Princess Karen began a pig farm. And it was interesting as the days passed. You know, it it was not a glamorous place to be. And yet everybody that worked there was satisfied. No one went hungry when they worked at Princess Karen's farm. And in fact, she was able to feed not just the people that worked there, but feed many of the villagers surrounding that would have otherwise lacked for food. And in fact, she ran her farm so well that eventually they did get into crops. They had plenty of manure. And, and it turned out that she was an excellent grain farmer as well. And, and, be, and it began to be a place that the community realized they could go to in a time of need. She always seemed to have a little extra food st- tucked away somewhere. And so, so the poor of the community, whether they worked there or they just needed something to help them get to the next payday, no one starved in her little area of that province. And in fact, even, even her animals seemed somehow happier to be part of her farm than they would elsewhere, even though you know they would one day be slaughtered. They seemed to be happy and content in the place that she was. It was a wonderful place of harmony, that farm. And like her two other sisters, her fame began to spread, not in the same way, it... it kind of trickled out around her province. And eventually, yes, it did make it to the, pro- to the palace when the queen began to ask about her. And so she, in secret, would go and watch the farm from a distance. You know, not to draw attention to herself, but the queen was curious. She, she knew that the princess had given up on the governorship that she had appointed her to. And yet she saw something happening there that she approved of. And so after s- several years, she came to Princess Karen and she said, 
princess, I've been watching you from afar. And she came up to her, actually right in the pig pen, put on her boots, boots, and she brought with her a box. And in the middle of the pig pen, she said, she said, you've done well, because you didn't care about the fame that you got from being a governor. You, in fact, didn't even care about having a high position. You thought it was better that somebody else do it instead, that could do it, you recognize, better than you. You recognize the talents of other people and use them well. But most of all, I can see that you love your people because you provide for them. You give them, whether it's food or employment or just seeing a need and something unused in this kingdom. You're loving your people well. And for that reason, I crown you the new queen of our land. And right there in the pig pen, among the manure and the smell, she opened the box and took out the, the crown, which she, the princess, Karen, had not realized until that moment her mother had no longer been wearing it. And she put it on Princess Karen's head. The princess was shocked. She said, I, I can't be queen. I've never... I've never spent the time studying our laws and, and the rules of our land like, like Princess Janine has done. I'm, I'm not wise in that way. And I've never even fought a single battle. I have no idea about the art of war. Princess Dina would, would make a much better ruler of our armies and protector of our kingdom. And Queen Moira looked at her and said, those things are all important. Uh, A ruler must be wise, and a queen must be brave. But those are things that you will learn over the years. But I cannot teach you to love your people. I cannot teach your sisters to love their people in the way that you love them now. And it's for that reason I want you to be queen. This this shocked Princess Karen because from her point of view, she... She thought she had kind of taken herself out of the race of the, the queen when she gave up the governorship. She th- thought, I've, I've lost my position of authority and I will just, I'll do what I think I can do to help my people. Not realizing that when a, a ruler loves their people, it changes the entire dimension of their authority. And I tell that story this morning because I want us to think in that way as well. That, that when you, we look at Jesus, we, we look at him and we say, Jesus, do you really love us? And we are looking for specific things. We all have expectations around love, what that's going to look like. And as we looked at that video earlier uh, that uh, Andrea shared with us, when Jesus loves us, he has some very specific ideas about what that's going to mean. And as we look at Isaiah chapter 11 this morning, I want us to think in terms of what it looks like for a king to love his subjects, particularly our King Jesus. What does it mean for him to love us? Sometimes we look to Jesus and we say, well, if you really loved me, you wouldn't make me suffer like this. You know, I, I wouldn't get migraines or I wouldn't have cancer or I wouldn't be suffering the way I have. It, Jesus, if you really loved our world, there would be no such thing as COVID-19. But I think if we have a little bit of empathy, we realize that when a king loves his people, it doesn't always turn out exactly the way we would want as his subjects. You know, he's a king. He's not a vending machine. We're not punching quarters into him and getting what we want from him. He is loving us in a very particular way. And Isaiah actually looks forward to that. He looks forward to a king who's going to rule with wisdom. Yes. Who's going to be brave and and deal with the wickedness and the difficulties in our world. But he's going to do it in a way that creates harmony. He's going to rule us well in a way that loves us, shows his love for us, his self-giving to us. And that's really what Isaiah chapter 11 describes as the rule of a loving king for his people. And so I'm just going to read that through here, the first nine verses. And it's a striking picture. But 
uh, Rylan read that first verse for us, and maybe to us we're not even sure if it's talking about Jesus, but it definitely is. It says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. And of course, Jesse was the king, was the son, sorry, not the son, the father of King David. And if you read uh, Isaiah chapters 7 to 12, we looked at a little video actually earlier about that um, uh, a few weeks ago about sort of an overview of that. And those five chapters all use the image of the kingdom of Judah being decimated, being destroyed. And the, the picture is of a forest that is cut down and then burned. And all that is left is sort of these charred stumps in a field. And so out of that image then, Isaiah says, a shoot will come up from one of the stumps, the stump of Jesse. And and, and the picture is that David's line is not forgotten. God's promise to David that he would always have a king, there would always be a descendant of David's to rule the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Israel, is being, we're being reminded of that. But it's in humble circumstances. It's not the stump of David. It's the stump of Jesse, this no-name farmer from Bethlehem. And, and it's sort of in this no-name, very rural, very poor area of Bethlehem that that shoot comes forth, of course, at Christmas, that Jesus is born in, in a stable. And so this is about Jesus. And it describes his rule over us. Verse 2 says, The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So he's going to be that wise judge for us. In fact, it says, He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. That's not to say he will not understand the evidence presented to him, but that he will be able to see past that, just as King Solomon was able to do when presented with the two mothers and the one child, and they both claimed that the child was theirs, but of course it could only belong to one mother. He was able to see beyond just the evidence that was presented to him. It's that kind of wisdom that Isaiah says Jesus will possess, and we see that lived out in the Gospels, but Verse 4 carries on, it says, But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. We don't often associate those words of justice and judgment with dealing with the poor and the needy. And yet, it is with righteousness that God says he's going to judge them in in the sense of lifting them up. Giving them the chance that they need, the mercy that a compassionate ruler would give them. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And then we have a striking picture in the final stanza. It says, the wolf will lie with, will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When you have a king, when you have a ruler that truly loves you, they keep their promises to you. Verse 1 reminds us of that promise made to David. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. When, When you have a king that really loves you, he's fully filled, completely filled with the spirit of God. He he, he attends to that most important relationship because to love our neighbors, to love his subjects, is to love God. And we talked to, saw that explained a bit in the video. When you have a king that truly loves his people, he judges with justice. He, 
He has righteousness as a, a foundational element of who he is. Verse 5 talks about the righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Those are actually belt and sash. Those are the same words, actually, in the original language. And it's saying it's the fundamental thing that holds everything else together. Faithfulness and righteousness. And and it's an expression of his love for us in using those things in his rule. But finally, I think we we can see God's love expressed for us as Jesus rules us because it creates harmony. Not just amongst us, but in all of creation. It says that the, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. And, and I don't have the zoological explanation for all of that. You know, maybe Evan's closer to that than me. You know, how the ox is going to live on grass and so is the lion. You know, is God going to make the lion grow extra stomachs? I, I don't know. It's kind of a mystery. But I think it's a beautiful picture of the harmony that God wants to create, not just in our lives and our relationships, but in our entire world. And that when we are ruled well by Jesus, it's that harmony is an expression of his love for us. And so if we're looking for God's love, if we're looking for trying to answer, well, Jesus, if you really loved me, you'd do what? If we want to see God's love, we, we can look for where he rules in our world. And we can see his love expressed clearly. That's if you want to see his love. If you want to feel his love, if you want to experience his love, then we need to let Jesus rule in our hearts. And then we can feel it. And I think how how much more appropriate than at Christmas that we would remember that there was a, a child born for us, not just to be our savior, but also to be our king. So I'm going to close with a word of prayer here, and then uh, I've got one last carol that I'd like us to, to listen to together. Some of these carols just express it far more eloquently than I ever could. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who is our good king, who is brave and wise, and all of those things that a good king ought to be, but most of all, he loves us. And, and he expresses his love toward us, in wonderful ways, in ruling us well and and sacrificing himself and his comfort and his dignity and his status, all those things he gave up so that he could come and be one of us and express your love for us in the most transparent and, and personal way possible. And so we thank you for your love that sent your son to be born in a, a dirty barn We thank you that he came and became one of us and and lived among us that we might see truly who you are, God, and, and be able to look into the face of Jesus. We thank you for your great love for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.